This is the Michael K. Show podcast. Listen live weekday afternoon starting at 3 on 98.7 ESPN in New York. The ESPN app, the TuneIn app, or on your smart speaker. Hey, Alexa, play 98.7 ESPN. This is Robin Roberts, and the Michael K. Show starts right now. Take it away, Michael, Don, and Peter. And a good afternoon, everybody. This is indeed the Michael K. Show. We thank you for joining us on this Tuesday, February 8th, 2022. Michael K., Don LaGreca, Peter Rosenberg. We're all apart, but we're together for the next four hours. The other 20, that's your responsibility. February 10th is the NBA trade deadline, and there is some action. So yesterday we had the C.J. McCollum trade, and today we have a trade that seems to upset a lot of people that are Nick fans, that are people that are associated with, Uh, and looking at what the Knicks could do. Um, The Indiana Pacers uh, have made a trade with Sacramento Kings, and the main package is essentially um, Tyrese Halliburton going from the Kings and the Pacers sending uh, DeMontis Sabonis um, to the Kings. And uh, the entire package is Pacers are including Jeremy Lamb, Justin Holliday, a 2027 second-round pick in exchange for Halliburton, Uh, guard Buddy Heal, and center Tristan Thompson, according to sources talking to Adrian Wojnarowski. Now, everybody's saying, well, that's all it took? That's all it took to get Halliburton? Now, Halliburton is a a nice young player and has done some good things, but I I don't know uh, how everybody within the sound of my voice feels. I I think Sabonis is a really, really good player. Further along in what he is going to be or his greatness than Halliburton is. Now, Halliburton's a pretty good player right now, but he's more of a lottery t- a ticket than Sabonis. Sabonis can play. The people that are knocking this, why did the Knicks get Halliburton if all it took is DeMontis Sabonis? And I would ask Don and Peter this to start off. Who on the Knicks, other than R.J. Barrett, is going to return what Sabonis can return? The Knicks don't have any Sabonis. You think the Kings are going to tra- trade that package of players for for Julius Randle, they don't have anybody on their team like Sabonis. And you're not going to trade R.J. Barrett because you're just opening up one hole to plug another. Why would you do that? So I wouldn't trade R.J. Barrett for Tyrese Halliburton. Now, if you want to knock the Knicks for taking Obi Toppin four picks ahead of when they could have had Tyrese Halliburton, well, okay, knock him for that. But don't knock him that it only took Sabonis and you didn't make the deal. Well, what do the Knicks have that equals Sabonis? Nothing other than R.J. Barrett. I, I I'm with you a thousand percent. I I don't I don't even know if I would have wanted to move. About I don't even know about moving Sabonis at all. Yeah, I'm, it's it's curious. I'm sort of surprised at the deal, to be honest. Um, maybe we're overestimating Sabonis. No, I I think that what they did was by moving Sabonis. Okay, now Miles Turner can move over to center. And that's what he wants to do. But while Sabonis was there, he had to play forward. So now he's going to move to center. He's supposedly thrilled about playing with Halliburton. And you clear up a little uh, a log jam. And, and, you know, they, they also made a trade. They're redoing their team. They made a trade earlier this week for Karis LeVert, which was a really good deal as well. Yeah. So I, I'm sorry. that I, I, think, I think the Pacers know what they're doing. So you add Halliburton. To a backcourt that includes Malcolm Brogdon and Chris Duarte, who the Knicks also wanted. So again, talk about what the Knicks did during the offseason all you want. But I'm sorry, I'm not gonna sit here and kill Leon Rose why he didn't get Tyrese Halliburton. Number one, they obviously don't like something about the guy because they took Obi Toppin, who, while he was a really good player in college with Dayton, he's not a he, he's not a finished product by any stretch of the imagination. So they took Obi Toppin over Tyrese Halliburton when they knew they needed a point guard. So maybe they don't like him. That's number one. And number two, he's got no um he's got nobody in the in the in the cupboard that would bring you Tyrese Halliburton other than RJ Barrett. I don't think there's a Nick fan out there that would sign off on trading RJ Barrett for Tyrese Halliburton. They, they just wouldn't. So stop. I mean, everybody's upset with the Knicks. They lost again last night. They look great, then they look bad. And everybody always says, oh they're so close to winning. But my point is, when you're a bad team, that's how you lose games. You can't finish. You can't close. You have that one bad quarter where you get embarrassed. You know the Knicks yesterday, I believe they went off on a 24-2 to run. And they still lost a game. And they're playing against a Utah Jazz team without Gobert. 
So they're awful. And I keep saying, I'll keep saying it. Where are the wins coming? Where's the urgency? They do have to make some kind of move. And everybody's saying, well, has, have all the moves dried up now? You know, but with McCullum being traded and, and, and Halliburton being traded. No, there's probably moves out there. It's up, to, it's up to the front office of the Knicks to find them. But they don't have as much as you think to move other than their stockpile of draft picks. And then when you're dealing for salary, you've got to make salaries match. You, get, you can't just take on a big number and not give back a big number. And the only big number on the Knicks is Julius Randle. And although he's had 30-point games in the last two games, he's not at the top of his value. So no one's going to give you a great player for Julius Randle. Also, I question what what's moved around between McCollum, Halliburton, Sabonis, Buddy Heald, all the different names we've seen in these deals that would have really changed the Knicks a lot right now. I'm not saying there aren't pieces there, but they're not a piece away, Michael. No, they're they, not a piece away. They, they're more than a Halliburton or a Sabonis away from really turning this thing on, especially when you, when you realize that they would have to get rid of a major piece too. Because say what you will about Randall, I, I, there's an argument to be made that he will be addition by subtraction. But, I mean, he, last night he was 50% from the floor and scored 30 points. So he's a key part of keeping them even in games at all. So I don't know that anything happened that really would have shifted things for the Knicks. So what do we do? Because the team's not winning. They're not going to make the playoffs, you wouldn't think. Not with this schedule. When they got Oh, they've got, by the way, Denver tonight, then Golden State. You know, this team's already lost, what, six games in a row on the road? They might win the Portland game, maybe. So you look at their schedule, and they probably aren't going to make the playoffs, and the whole thing was either play the kids or make a move. And you're right, Michael, there are still moves to be made, but it's not like anything on their roster is going to become more attractive. So is there any deals to make to salvage this season, or are we just left with, all right, let's just let's scrap this year, play the kids, and, and, and regroup during the offseason? It might have to be that. It, it might have to be that. They've got to make some decisions. And maybe maybe after the trade deadline goes and Julius Randle knows he's not going to be traded, maybe he becomes a better player again. Maybe he gets rid of the anger that he has simmering in him where he's getting technical fouls or he's slapping uh, the computer guy's computer in the huddle. All of those things. He just doesn't seem like all is right in his world. So maybe if the trade deadline passes, then he, he, he has a good remainder of the season and becomes more of a trade chip. But take a look at the Nick roster, everybody. Tell me who's clamoring for who. Kemba Walker, he, he, he's, he's a shot asset. Evan Fournier, I, I mean, I, don't, I haven't seen it. There's no consistency there. He'll have a great game. He'll have five bad ones. Nerland's Noel, I mean, a $30 million set, set up in flames. He can't stay healthy. You know, what, you know who has some value, but he doesn't make a lot of money, so you can't really include him in a big deal. Mitchell Robinson, do you want to? Or do you want to? Is he part of the solution? Because he's an unrestricted free agent at the end of this year because he was a second-round draft pick. So they have to decide, do they want to keep this guy? Or if he becomes an unrestricted free agent, somebody's going to give him so much money that Knicks will go, no, it's not worth it. So where's the value for the Knicks other than R.J. Barrett? And I, I think I think the stat is the Knicks have not signed a draft pick to a second contract since right. Charlie Ward. That's amazing. So at some point you got to keep your own. If you're going to grow it like all the Knicks fans, well, we got to build slowly. Well, building slowly means you got to keep your draft picks. You got to hit on them. Is Obi Toppin a guy you're going to keep? Grimes looks like a guy you're going to keep as long as Thibs is here because Thibs loves him. But where where where's the keepers here, everybody? Am I missing something? Uh, we can all clamor for the Knicks to make deals. I'm sure they're trying. Again, unless you want to trade R.J. Barrett, you're not getting anything great back. Now, I know that our good buddy, Alan Hahn, was not happy with this Pacer deal. And here's what he said on, on Barton Hahn. You could hear them from 12 to 3 right before our show. Uh, here's Alan. If you're telling me that Therese Halliburton was available mm. and all it took to get him was DeMontis Sabonis, this trade here 
is alarming to me. The Pacers have essentially like broken up that team. They had understood where they were, which was on a treadmill to nowhere. So they broke up that team. To tell me that you could have traded for Therese Halliburton and the biggest piece in a trade for a guy like that, who is a talent, high IQ player, something you're lacking, excellent passer, seven assists a game, good three-point shooter, tall guard, and all you needed was DeMontis Sabonis to start the deal. I want to know if the Knicks were in on this at all. See, uh, you know I love Allen. Think the world of him. Knows a lot of basketball. He's an expert at it. But he's wrong. He, he I'm sorry. He is wrong about Sabonis. Sabonis is not just another guy. Let, let me give you Sabonis' stats. He, he averages 18.9 points per game, 12.1 rebounds, 5 assists. He has 34 double-doubles this season. He only trails Jokic and Rudy Gobert. This is a player, man. So... To say it only took Sabonis to get Halliburton, uh, I can't look at it that way. So who did I, Allen want to have in that deal if the Knicks were to make it? I don't know. where. where I, I'd, lo- I'd love – I mean, he usually he's driving home at this point. But just just text and say, who did you – who did the Knicks have to match up that, that would be equal to Sabonis and make the requisite amount of money to make the salaries work? And also, don't be caught sleeping. Sabonis was so good that he also brought uh, Heald to the Pacers. Heald's third in the NBA in three-pointers this season. He's a good player. And one thing that this does do, well, the Kings have made a choice. De'Aaron Fox is going to be the point guard, not Halliburton. So now De'Aaron Fox is out. Unless it's going to be a complete strip down, and they don't care if they leave the position open. But... Again, I don't think the Knicks are paralyzed here. I just, I just think that they don't have enough assets to make deals like this. It's a, it's a, it's a talent um, bereft lineup and and roster, and and the guys that are pretty good are guys making a little bit of money. So it's hard to make deals like this. You got to put five or six players in to make the salaries add up. It's very complicated to make deals. It's not like in baseball. Here's your guy, I'll take that guy. The, the money money shouldn't matter. You're not matching up cap money. Here you have to match up cap money. It's very complicated. Well, the question is, were they even in on it? Because as you said, maybe that Halliburton is somebody they don't like. That's a possibility, too. They weren't even in. It absolutely could be. Halliburton, 14.3 points per game, 7.4 assists, 3.9 rebounds. And 1.7 steals. He's tied for sixth in the league in steals per game and is 11th in assists. He's a player. He can play. As Allen said, he's got length. He's a good player. But Brian Windhorst was on with um, Barton Hahn after that as well, and he said, I think you're I think you're a little short on what you think of Sabonis. I think in the NBA, people are looking and go, wow, that's, that's not a bad deal. I mean, the Pacers got better, but the, 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 I don't think the Kings got rooked. King and Rook. See what I did? Like I a saw chess that. move? The wow. King's Nation was not happy. Just no. looking on social media. Is King's Nation a thing? Well, I don't know. I'm sure they have fans. I think it's more like King's Borough. I don't know if it's a whole <laughs> well, it's now, in the, the King's neighborhood. Sacramento so they, they, and they stinks. And they all were on Twitter ripping the deal. But always be careful, Michael, with these stats you're throwing out on players on bad teams. True. I would love Sabonis on my team. Love him. The guy does it all. He's really good. He's got a great pedigree, too. And they decided we're going um, We're going with De'Aaron Fox. We like De'Aaron Fox more than we like Halliburton. And it also tells you, uh, who's the other player? Um, oh, yeah. They have a rookie, Davion Mitchell, they like as well. So they go with Fox and Mitchell, and they say, okay, Halliburton's going to be traded. And they get a really excellent player back for him. So I, I'm not as down on the deal as, as Kings fans are. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I mean, either. I don't know. Why don't we, what does Andrew think? Andrew? Well, uh, hey there. Uh, I agree with you. I was surprised. I think looking at it now, it looks good. My instinct, though, when I first saw it was that I was surprised they were willing to let Halliburton go. I just thought, I guess, that they thought more of him than whatever they think of De'Aaron Fox because Fox's name has been in trade rumors way more than Halliburton's has over the Mm -hmm. last few weeks. So I just kind of was 
conditioned to think they were cool with Fox being the one to leave, but I guess not. I guess they fooled everyone. And it, and it, it uh, teams know players better than anybody. That's why you always have to be careful when you make deals with certain teams. And maybe they don't like Halliburton for some reason. Maybe the Knicks don't like Halliburton. Again, they could have drafted him. Instead, they took a player at a position where they already had a player. Rather than pick a point guard that they needed. So they might not like him. Now, the other team in town, well, the Nets are playing the Celtics tonight. And once again, James Harden is not playing. And although Steve Nash has said it's not happening, and four weeks ago the Nets turned down overtures from the uh, the Sixers, I'll tell you what, I think I think a trade could still happen. I really do. And, and here's why it could be a, a slow boil for the what the Nets are doing to the Sixers. The Sixers think, okay, I'm not going to give up the farm to get James Harden, but they desperately want James Harden. And they said, we'll get him as a free agent. Well, the Sixers are in cap hell. So they're going to have to make so many moves to create space to bring on Harden's contract and then sign him to a deal where he's going to make over $50 million a year because that's what he would warrant in the market. And what Sean Marks is probably doing is squeezing and saying cough because the way you make it work is you give us Simmons, you give us Maxie. um, There's other players that you could throw in there. You give us um, Curry, and if not, okay, wait till the offseason, see if you can make this work, because I don't think you can. So it could be a case of that. And by having Nash go, we're not trading him, and by having Nash say, I've spoken to Harden, he wants to stay here, well, it doesn't look like the Nets are desperate. So the Nets are almost in a position of strength, and for the Sixers, if you think about it, and Andrew could correct me if I'm wrong, if they make the deal for Harden, and Harden becomes Harden, they can win a championship, and I don't think I'm stretching that. They can win a championship, but with Joel Embiid maybe winning the MVP and Simmons' contract just lying there on the cap with the guy not playing, Andrew, I don't think they can win a championship with the team as presently constructed without Simmons playing. Am I right? This this current team? Yeah. No. I but don't if they, they brought can. in Harden, they could. Yes, I believe so. So who's got the stress? Now, you could say, well, the Nets could win too, but there's a lot of ifs there. Are they going to take away the vaccine mandate? Is Harden really going to be engaged? Is Harden going to have his hamstring bother him? What's the deal with Durant? I think Durant's going to come back and be fine. And their record, I think, is 13-3 and when the big three plays together. So there's a lot of ifs there. I still don't think dealing Harden is a dead deal. I don't. I think these they're both doing the dance of seduction here, seeing who has any kind of a um, leverage at all. I don't know if either team has a, a, a great amount of leverage. But the Nets don't want to lose Harden for nothing because I don't think he's going to opt in. Do you think he's really hurt? Or is this just him pulling a Houston again? You can never tell. I never want to question guys' injuries. And and the last time he had a hamstring injury, it was really, really bad. So I I think that all of this started because this guy used to be an Iron Man. It all started when he fatted his way out of Houston. He was in terrible shape. Then the deal was made to the Nets. And then he did something that he hardly ever does. He pulled a muscle, and it was really bad, and it hurt them in the playoffs and probably cost them a chance to win a championship. And I think he's still paying for the indiscretion of getting out of shape to get himself out of Houston. He betrayed his body. He betrayed his craft, and his body is not the same now. And he's 33 years old. It's not as easy to snap your finger and go, okay, I'm in shape now. Because there's going to be residual damage. And I think he has caused himself residual damage by having not been in shape and then going full bore with the Nets. And I don't know if he wants to play, but everything, you you, you watch the body language, you see the stats. I mean, for him to score four points, I think it was against the Kings, too. It's it's just, it doesn't make sense. Why does it have to be that way, though? Why, I don't why know. Can't, why can't you go to management and say, listen, I, I'm, I'm not happy here. A lot of dysfunction. I'm not going to resign, so please try to trade me. But in the meantime, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to bust my butt and I'm going to help you win games. Like, what, can't can't that be done? So you, you're going to have to. Again, we don't know if he's really hurt or whatever, but you know, you saw what happened in Houston. Well, you can't know how you it's done. Tell- what well, Cam Reddish did: go tell the front office, then not say a word, and let the front office right. do its, its deal. Because that's that's motivation enough to trade him. Not not that he's unhappy. Not that he's not playing. It's just that hey, I'm not going to resign with you. So, so a lot, 
So it makes sense to go out there and play well because if you don't get traded, then don't you want to see what can happen here in the final year with the Nets? You would think so. You would think so, but I think that what Brady did going to um, the Bucks, Matthew Stafford did it the right way. You know, they said, you know, probably best we part, and he gets traded to a Super Bowl contender. I think a lot of other quarterbacks are looking at that. I think you're going to see that with Kyler Murray. I think you might see that with Russell Wilson. Aaron Rodgers exploring it as well. These stars are emboldened by what no. James Harden did. No, I, I get it, Michael, but you know what? For all of the wackiness with Aaron Rodgers, he still went out there and had an MVP caliber season. Yep. You know, he made it work in Green Bay for that what possibly could be his last year. Tom Brady made the playoffs with New England. He played his heart out, and then he saw the opportunity to leave, and he left. I've got no problem with that. You're a free agent. Play out your contract. Go anywhere you want to go. But what I don't like is is that you're trying to like force a deal beyond just asking for a deal. If you want to ask for a deal, go ahead and do it. Knock on the door. Say, listen, I'm out. Trade me right now because I'm not going to resign here. But a power move of not playing or not giving your best, to me, that that's weak. Because if a deal can't get done, then you got to try to make it work here. So why not win as many games as you can, finish as high a seed as you can, and get the best chance to win a championship? Because I do think they're going to want the higher seed because I do believe by the time we get to the playoffs, Kyrie's going to be allowed to play. Well, along those lines, Don, this is from ABC7 here in here New York. York. Uh, Governor Kathy Hochul indicated that New York's indoor vaccine or mask mandate it could be lifted by tomorrow. Right. But is hinting that the school mask mandate could remain in place a little longer. That's because the numbers with children are still higher than the previous variant. So but, he'll play. That means he's going to play. Yeah. So we, we, and we figured this was going to work itself out. So, so why can't you just make it work here? And if a deal happens, a deal happens. Then you go hit the ground running in Philadelphia. I'm not begrudging his opportunity to leave. And if he doesn't want to be here, that's fine. But I just never understood why you got to act like this. Say you want to be traded, but just still go out there and, and bust your butt. The Nets, Nets didn't do anything to Harden. All right, it's not the Nets' fault that Kyrie can't play. It's not the Nets' fault that Durant's hurt. That dysfunction was placed upon them. It wasn't anything that they created. Just the unusual circumstances. What's going to happen six months from now when he's unhappy in Philadelphia? You're right. You're right. But Daryl Morey seems like um, he knows what Harden wants. He built a team around Harden uh, in Houston. Harden was happy when Morey was there, so... We'll see how this plays out. 1-800-919-3776. We'll take your phone calls. Before we break, I was kind of stunned about an hour and a half ago, just scrolling through Twitter, and I saw that uh, the former Yankee, Gerald Williams, at the age of 55, has passed mm. away. Wow. I, 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 was just, I was just blown away. I did not know that he was battling cancer, and um, it was uh, revealed in a post um, on the Players' Tribune, and there was a quote from Derek Jeter, and I've not been uh, able to get a hold of, of Derek, but uh, my my take would be that Derek is absolutely devastated. Those two, I mean, you always hear this word brothers thrown around. They were absolutely like brothers. That's how close they were. Uh, Gerald was always with Derek. Gerald was the one who stopped um, the hazing of Derek in spring training. They got really particularly, t- not in spring training, in the minor leagues, got particularly tough. Uh, there was one guy that was really riding Derek really hard. And then Gerald, who was incredibly strong, he he just walked up to the guy. So okay, that's enough. Next time you go to him, you have to go through me, and you're not going to like that. And it stopped. And Derek Jeter was able to, you know, just think about playing and not worried about being hazed all the time and made fun of as a young kid, 18 years old, homesick, crying in his hotel room. They were fused at the hip. How close they were. They were inseparable. Uh, even in in retirement, you saw Derek. You saw Gerald. It was it was just that thing. And, and Derek's heart must be broken today. And you know Gerald. If you look at his numbers, he had a really nice major league career. He was with the 1996 Yankee championship um, team uh, until they the made the trade, I believe, w- with the Brewers. But he was a he made a huge, huge, huge catch um, on Alex Rodriguez early in the game in um, in Doc Gooden's no hitter. That should have been a double, but Gerald Williams was just such an unbelievable defender. He had such a great arm. Uh, he was a lovely guy. Always had a nice word for people. I'm mean, just seeing, you know, Gene Monahan, the longtime trainer of the Yankees, tweeted out, "I'm stunned. I'm heartbroken. I can't believe this." I mean, 
55 years old. He, he didn't really live a long life. I'm sure he lived a full life. He leaves behind a wife uh, and, and a bunch of teammates that really loved him and a lot of fans that loved him as well. Just just awful news. It just it just really it hit me across the face today because I, I, I didn't know he was ill. And then you find out he passed away after a battle with cancer. So our condolences to Gerald's family, uh, to all of Gerald's friends and teammates, the Yankee organization, the other teams that he played for, and also Yankee fans who were taking this hard because Gerald was a big part of that team turning the corner and going from bad to good. And, and I know that, you know, Derek Jeter and, and Gerald Williams were one, were one and the same. That's how close they were. So um, just really sorry to hear that today. Um, and again, condolences to the Williams family. We'll be back. Thanks for listening to the Michael K show podcast. Hey buddy. Hey, catch the show on demand wherever you want. Just subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, Knicks against Denver. Also nine o'clock, eight 30, the pregame right here on 98, seven. Uh, we just get news. Uh, Mitchell Robinson had a great game yesterday against Utah. He's out with a back injury. Nice. Grimes and Noel both out with knees. So that's going to be interesting. Um, then we have Boston at Brooklyn, 7.30 start on yes. Uh, and then a big college game locally, Villanova at St. John's mm. uh, at the Garden. Uh, St. John's needs this game to be relevant um, the rest of February and, and maybe play into to March. They have not had a signature win. Beating Villanova would be big, and that's an 8.30 start, and you could watch it on FS1. That's game time brought to you by Telemore Dew Irish Whiskey during the big games this season. Enjoy a Telemore Dew, the original triple blended, triple distilled, triple cask matured Irish whiskey. Remember, when it's game time, it's Tully time. Please enjoy responsibly. Now, we mentioned the um, Kathy, um, Governor Hochul, saying they're going to lift mask mandates and vaccine, ma- vaccine mandates uh, as, as soon as tomorrow. Wow, that's but square. the one caveat that we have to say in relation to Kyrie Irving being ready to play, that's the state mandate. Cities have individual mandates, so it would be up to Mayor Adams to say we're, we're also going to rescind it here. He might not do that. So he it doesn't not. mean if it's lifted tomorrow that Kyrie's going to be playing uh, the next net game. No, but it does tell you we are getting to the point where it's going to happen sooner or later. So it may not happen tomorrow, but I would think by the time we the regular season is over, I think he'll be back. I, I would be shocked, Michael, if he, he's not playing by the playoffs at least. So we're, we're seeing – listen, anything it's on can the happen. But it, right, you're right. We're on the path where that seems logical. And it may not happen tomorrow. may not happen this month. But I still think there's plenty of basketball where it could matter to the Nets. All right, let's, uh, let's go to the phones. How about that? Sure. Let's go to uh, Charlie uh, in Sunnyside. Charlie? Hey, how you guys doing? Uh, thanks for having me on. I've been a really, really big fan of all of you for a long time. Mike, you're calling me a lot to me. Uh, Peter, you. great job with the album last. Thank you. Um, just to provide a little bit more context on the um, Halliburton trade. Mm-hmm. Um, and I can understand you guys really, really like the bonus a lot, but just wanted to read some things out that kind of make it uh, difficult for me to see Sabonis as the best player in this trade. Um, 93 players have tried at least 300 jumpers this year. Hal Burton ranked sixth in efficiency. All the NBA. 49 players have tried at least 100 off the dribble threes. Uh, He's second. Uh, He makes 43% of his catch and shoot threes. Uh, He's 21 years old. Uh, He ranks 12th in the NBA in steals. Uh, In 12 games without Darren Fox this season, he's averaging 19 and 10. And he actually averages more blocks per game uh, than the bonus. So in a league that is increasingly going towards off the dribble, you know, sort of dynamicism and really uh, a center, all they need to do is protect the paint. Um, so bonus can't do that uh, even as effectively as Halliburton can. And Halliburton hasn't beat with, with everything else. So, I mean, I'll uh, Charlie, Charlie listen, I, no, but I, but, uh, I want to just throw, because you obviously know your game. So let me ask you that. What I'm not saying that Halliburton's a bad player. I'm saying that Sabonis is not a terrible player. They didn't get Rook, but my point is about the Knicks. Who the Knicks have that would measure up to Sabonis to get Halliburton? R.J. Barrett. I right, you don't want to give him up, that right? Give up, man. I would give up R.J. Barrett for, uh, for Halliburton in a heartbeat. Yeah. You really would. Wow. 
Well, you yeah. know what? The Knicks. Well, well but, but but Charlie, they could not have thought that much about Halliburton. Right. They took Obi Toppin Less before to, him, yeah. and there's no way you would trade Obi Toppin now for Halliburton. The Kings would laugh at you. Less so that's what the Knicks thought of Halliburton. But even if you believe that, Michael, and you believe that Halliburton is is a better player than Barrett, how does overall it make you better? Don't you want to start finding players that can play together? Even if you felt he was a little bit better, Michael, overall, does it make your team better? Uh, it's according to who you're subtracting. So if, you ta- if, you, I'm if you're saying, trading if you R.J. Think, Barrett, you're not. It's not making you better. I, I, I get it. Even if you thought he was slightly better, which I, which I disagree, overall, you're look, Barrett's a guy you want to keep. You want to try to find players to play with him. You don't want to run and in also, place here. I, I don't think you tra- – I would not trade R.J. Barrett. For Halliburton. And and the people that would be making the trade are the people that decided to draft Obi Toppin over Halliburton. So what, what sense would that make? They'd be laughed at. Wait, wait. You're trading the be- the best player on your team for a guy that you could have had for a draft pick rather than Obi Toppin. It would, it would make them look like fools. They had every chance to take Halliburton. They were they – were they were told by so many fans, so many people in oh the media, my. they've got to take Halliburton. They've got, and they passed him over for Obi Toppin. I'm not diminishing Obi Toppin, but you couldn't trade Obi Toppin straight up for Halliburton. There's no chance. That was the consensus pick. If I if I go back to, because that was during the you know, beginning of the pandemic draft 2020, Halliburton seemed like the guy that all the Knicks fans wanted, and he ended up going four picks later. Let's go to um, Paul in Staten Island. Paul. Hmm. I'm sorry, sorry, Michael. I was on. I was. Uh, I was on the uh, speakerphone. That's uh, all right. What's listen, up? Uh, yesterday you mentioned that you were having uh, problems as far as like Super Bowl game stuff. Right. Mm-hmm. And my friend uh, owns a sports bar in town. I live in Staten Island, and it's not like the NFL official stuff. Oh, no. But he's got the the two helmets and you know whatever. Okay. Um. You know, before you hang up on me, if you're interested, I'll FedEx something to the ESPN wow. um, in nice. New York and for you and your son. Wow, that's, um, that, you know, Paul, that, that is, is nice. That interested. is really nice of you. Um, you know, Jody was searching the Internet, and what she ended up getting, Paul, was just a, a T-shirt that said with the Bengals logo on it and a T-shirt with the Rams logo on it. It's funny because... <laughs> You know, so many people are saying, well, you could get it on Amazon Prime and you could get it on Fanatics. And I told Jody that. And, you know, Jody doesn't really get rankled that much. And she goes, do people think I didn't try that? Do people think I didn't try that? She said, I tried that. She goes, they can't deliver it before the weekend. They could deliver it next week. So people keep, like, sending, well, you get this jersey on Amazon. No, you can't. Hmm. They can't deliver it in time. Well, wasn't that a nice thing that guy That was very nice. Listen, listen, eh. It's not exactly the Bengals, all right? It's missing the second L. That's the deal we have. But it's, right. All right. I don't know how many L's there is in Bengals to start out, but trust me, you'll never know the difference, all right? You got to be careful with that because I had my – I love my Aunt Polly, my late Aunt Polly. Oh, I yeah, loved her too. She was frugal, okay? So she would always get, like, the kind of knockoff stuff, and, and I was fine. And she, for whatever reason, got me – when the Bulls were going for three championships in a row, she thought I'd be interested. She gave me a, a T-shirt. And if you remember, Pat Riley went out and got the copyright for 3P. Yep. So she found a shirt, and it had Jordan and Pippen, and I forget who the, the third person was, and it had the Bulls logo, and it, it said, Chicago Bulls, three times Pete. <laughs> That's that's what you want, okay? Wow. Trust me, Michael. Hey, listen, I I, 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 I didn't mind. I was always in a huge basketball, but I did wear it. But you got to be careful, you know, especially young. You don't want it, like you said, you don't want the Bengals without the E. This is just as good. It says Roms versus Bengals. Right. You'll love it. Now, also, Jody points out, it's kid sizes. They don't have kids like medium. Both ah, of our right. kids, sure, they sure. don't have kid sizes. Well, I think Tony had some kid sizes, too. He's got it all. B-E-N-G-U-L-L-S. Bengals. Bengals. That was very nice. Thank you that so much. That was nice. Um, Don, where'd you grow up? This is where Mike is from. Hawthorne. Mike in, there you go. 
Mike's an author now. I don't know if you know this or not. No, he's an author? Yes, he is. What? Tell me. Tell him, Mike. Uh, well, it's, it's it's not me. It's it's my my brother-in-law, uh, Tom Doctor Tom Gorman uh, did a uh, did an un- unbelievable story about about my mom. I Don, I sent you the book. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. After you read it, I'd love to call and get get your ideas. But thank you very much. Yeah, it's uh, called uh, I called her Mary. It's a, it's a pretty cool story. But thank you very much about that. Uh, and Mike Michael, first of all, I'm sorry about I'm sorry about Gerald. I remember. You know, he was just a great player, and you could always you always told you could always tell he was one of those guys on the team that you that you wanted on your team that you would play for. And um, I, I my heart goes out to all the Yankee guys that, and I'm sorry about I'm sorry about the loss. That's, that's especially at 55. That's terrible. Yeah. But uh, I know I know that you that, and you could just hear it in your voice, Mike. That's why <clears throat> that's why everybody loves you, Michael K. Because you're sincere. But. uh what I was, what I wanted to talk about is how I'm a basketball junkie my whole life, and I still coach it at 60 years old. I, I love it. It's what I do. What I love to do. It's getting harder and harder to really be a, a basketball fan. And I know Peter, you know Peter knows the game very well. He's been doing it a long time. But when you're hearing about this, you know the guy gave the Knicks fans the middle finger, and now he's mad because of whatever. And then you got, you know, you got the other guy on on the, on the Nets who fatted himself out, like you said, in Houston. And wants you know going to get fifty million dollars, but you know you don't know if he's going to play hard. You know you're trying to coach kids, you're trying to work with kids, you're trying to get them to play hard and do the right thing. And and then you know the role models are, are guys that just and not everyone. I'm just talking about what we're looking at here in New York and what a pitiful job that we've had to see in sports. But uh, it's just hard, and, it, and it's hard to stay a fan. It's hard to stay involved. I don't want to be that old guy that doesn't like the young kids because it's the complete opposite. But uh, it's just, it's just getting harder and harder when you when you're hearing these stories about these guys that are incredibly talented athletes that just they seem to pack it in and, and want to and want and want to force things that are just in my opinion unthinkable at times. But but again, thank you and, and sorry for your loss there, Mike. And have a good day, guys. Yeah, thank Thanks, you, Mike. Mike. Yeah, it, you know what? I, the players have the power now, and, and you know they should have a lot of power because they're the product too. But sometimes they wield that power in very, very odd ways. Yeah, just wield the power. Go into the front office, say, trade me. But to not play or not to give your all. And, again, I don't know if Harden is out tonight because he's really hurt or, or just wants to be that guy. But we know he did in Houston. So it's hard to give him the benefit of the doubt because we've seen this act before. And maybe the Nets just want him out so he doesn't get hurt before they trade him. So That's can't put it all on him. That they, they, it, or maybe it's a mix of both. Marvel. He's going, ah, I'm not sure. I'm like, hey, you know what? Rest. It's okay. Yeah, rest. No, take your time. Yeah, take your time. I want to tell you a quick story um, about Gerald Williams uh, and the type of guy he was. So I was talking with Susan Waldman today, and she got to spring training in 1996, and she had just um, uh, had her first chemo treatment. And she was determined to work through her chemo, and it really took a lot out of her. Uh, as she was battling cancer. And she walked into the Yankee Spring Training uh, clubhouse, and Gerald Williams jumped out of his seat and put his arm around her and said, how's my girl doing? And you could say, well, I mean, a human being would do that. Well, not everybody does stuff like that, especially in the world of professional sports where everybody's so worried about themselves. But that was the first thing he wanted to do to show that she had his support. And it meant the world to her. It meant the world to her. So there, there are things that people do that stay with you. Really, it stays with you. We'll be back. Thanks for listening to the Michael K. Show podcast. Well, that's awesome. Looking for more access to the show? That's right, man. Check us out on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at TMKS ESPN. This, this, this is the Michael K show. Who on the Knicks other than RJ Barrett is going to return what Sabonis can return? The Knicks don't have any Sabonis. You think the Kings are going to trade that package of players for Julius Randle? They don't have anybody on their team like Sabonis, and you're not going to trade RJ Barrett because you're just opening up one hole to plug another. Now, if you want to knock the Knicks for taking Obi Toppin four picks ahead of when they could have had Tyrese Halliburton, well, okay, knock him for that, but don't knock him that it only took Sabonis and you didn't make the deal well, what do the Knicks have that equals to bonus? Nothing other than R.J. Barrett. The Michael K. Show. I don't know that anything happened that really would have shifted things for the Knicks. On 98.7 ESPN. All right, so that Halliburton trade has certainly been uh, a source of discussion here in the early going of the show. Here is uh, Woj on NBA Today, 
and his reaction to the Halliburton trade? Stunned. I mean, Tyrese Halliburton was stunned, Malika. The league is stunned at this trade. And the fact that he was even available. I think there were a lot of teams who thought if we knew we could have gotten Tyrese Halliburton, you know, we would have been really knocking at the door in Sacramento. This was a player who everyone had thought, including Tyrese Halliburton, that he'd be the cornerstone for their future. And it begs the question, why'd they trade him? Hmm. Why did they trade him? So you, you mean to tell me that 28 other NBA teams didn't do their due diligence checking in to see if Halliburton was available? I find that hard to believe. You got to do your due diligence. Yeah. You got to make constant phone calls. Unless there was just, you know, they 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 called the team that had a player they wanted. Maybe they didn't call the Knicks because they, they looked at the Knicks roster and said they don't have anything we want. Was it All that? Right, th- this just uh, from the L.A. Times. Uh, after a five-month review uh, by the Pasadena police into allegations of sexual assault, uh, Dodger pitcher Trevor Bauer will not face criminal charges. Los Angeles County's District Attorney's Office determined today a person with knowledge of the decision said the District Attorney decided criminal charges were not warranted. That does not mean that Bauer has been cleared to rejoin the Dodgers. Major League Baseball Commissioner Mark Rob Manfred retains the right to suspend Bauer. He is widely expected to do so, but not soon. That's why with these things, man, I'm not saying this guy's any innocent. All these things pointed to, you know, what he did to the woman, mm-hmm. you know, violent with her, and oh, he's definitely going to get charged. Well, he wasn't charged. Yeah, because they didn't think they can get a conviction. Huh? That doesn't mean he didn't do it. You know, well, it, that ba- ba- baseball doesn't have to worry about getting a right. conviction. See, they just have to think something was wrong. Right, because because in a court of law, you've got to you've got to prove it beyond a shadow of a doubt. But being involved in something like that, even if there were no criminal charges, they could still say, I, "We don't think we want you." playing in our league um now he served the the what was a, a year right yeah but got paid got paid yeah, 40 got million dollars not to play but i think at some point you know he'll he'll be able to come back and and, and perform it's uh, it's interesting because at the time of the charges or the investigation uh, i learned that even if somebody says i i want you to hit me even if you do that you're committing a crime no matter what they ask you to wow. do that's a crime that's but, what came out of this well, That's like I mean, one of the things in there? Well, I mean, if you look at the pictures of the woman, I don't want to get into specific details. There are kids in the car listening, but it's not pretty what happened. Mm. Um, going into break, I mentioned sometimes it's hard to root for somebody, even if it's the right thing to root for them. Huh? So the Houston Texans job ended up going to Lovey Smith. And then Brian Flores and his lawyers released a statement congratulating Lovey Smith. And I'm paraphrasing here, so guys... You know, correct me if I'm going off the reservation a bit. Okay. But he essentially said, congratulations to Lovey Smith, but, you know, I, I was the most qualified. And, the, you know, I, I had a great interview. And the only reason I didn't get the job was because I filed a lawsuit. Let somebody else say that, Brian. That's a bad job. That's just an awful job. It's also an awful job to, to say to do that about Lovey Smith. Why is he caught in the crossfire? He didn't do anything wrong. Yeah, I was curious about that. I, I listen. He, is he wrong? No, he's not. Well, we wrong, don't but know if he's wrong. No, but it's almost obvious. It's almost like so obvious that it doesn't even need to be said. Like, oh, really? You didn't. You're no longer up for the Houston job. We we didn't. Wasn't that sort of well, the reason he's been lauded for making this sacrifice is because of that? Like, we knew you weren't going to get that job anymore. But why so, say you were more qualified than Lovey Smith? Right. That's why, not. You don't know that. That's that's the thing. It's like. It, it, he could have he could have had someone else who basically would have said that without him having to be the one. That, people yeah. would have said that. Right. They didn't need it. Right. Now, it's almost like people won't say it because he said it. I, I it was a it was a misstep. I think. First of all, you don't even have to have a statement. Now, if you're going to have a statement, then your statement should read, "Congratulations to Lovey Smith on landing the job," but there's still a lot more work to be done because there's still less black head coaches than there were at the start of last year. And just say that, you know, the work is not done. The lawsuit is going to continue. Because when you look at the timeline for Lovey Smith, it sure looks like he was hired because of this lawsuit. He didn't seem like he was a candidate until all of a sudden. But fine, that's the way it worked out. I mean, that's, I guess that's a good thing. That means that it's working. You're, you're opening some eyes. But he gets the job, and now that statement kind of comes across like, right, what's your motivation? Is your motivation to make the supreme sacrifice to right the wrong? Or are you just looking for a gig? 
Because, it, boy, it just really came across like, well, you're pouting that you, you weren't offered a job. So what's your motivation here, the greater good or just getting you a job? Now, if you want to really decipher what went on in Houston, they desperately wanted to hire Josh McCown. That's the guy. Yeah. That's the guy they wanted. And then when this lawsuit – now, this lawsuit probably – lost Josh McCown the job because how would it look to hire a guy with absolutely no coaching experience over a qualified candidate like Brian Flores? It would look terrible. Lovey Smith wasn't even under consideration. So they said the optics of hiring Josh McCown in this climate would be so bad, and they pivoted and they hired Lovey Smith. That's what they did. But to say I'm more quality, and you might be more qualified than Lovey Smith, Although Lovey didn't do a terrible job with the Bears. He did a bad job in college. And Tampa wasn't great either. But he was their associate head coach last year. You know, it wasn't like they're completely foreign to him. But, hey, he probably was hired because of the lawsuit. Well, then that's a good thing, right? That means the lawsuit's working. But whatever it is, but but now, now you're all upset because you didn't get offered the job? So what's your motivation, Brian? Well, I mean, it depends. I wouldn't say it's a good thing that it happened because of the lawsuit. I don't know if it shows that the lawsuit's working much as it shows that people are trying to cover their own, you know what. Well, but but, but I, I I guess thank God for small victories, Peter. I, I yeah, understand no, what you're because saying. you're right. It did prevent. Let's let's be honest. What was what was about to happen was what felt like an underqualified sort of bit of cronyism in Josh McCown getting the job. It it, it felt like. There were um, credible and qualified black men available for a job that they were going to give to a 39-year-old inexperienced white guy. And instead, they were like, you know what? We shouldn't do that. We should give it to one of these qualified black men. So, yes, you're right, Don. In that sense, it probably did serve its purpose. Um, but I, you, it's hard. I just don't trust any motivation with anything that any of these franchises no, do but, right but, now. But, but nothing was – you really think that this lawsuit was all of a sudden going to make them find religion? You knew that at least in the preliminary, right. you were going to have to force them to change their way of thinking. So, all right, Lovey Smith was probably not going to get this job if not for the lawsuit. But now Lovey's got a chance to maybe turn things around in Houston and kind of get things going. I mean, so I, I, I hear what you're saying, but I, did you really think all these people were going to just wrap their arms around each other, sing Kumbaya, and say we were wrong? Or were they going to be forced into rethinking and then hopefully over time change the narrative? That's it. You're right. They're not finding religion, and if they do, it's fake. Yeah, we did say when when the story broke that you know these are these are men that almost are incapable of embarrassment. But I think they realized that they would have looked so bad hiring Josh McCown. Now, who's to say they won't fire Lovey Smith after one year like they did to David Cully? But if they're so hot and heavy on Josh McCown, then hire the guy on your staff. Make him the offensive coordinator. Make him the quarterback coach. Get him some experience before you would move to him. But that's the guy they wanted to hire. And we'll see how it works out. You know, maybe Josh McCown turns out to be the next great head coach. And maybe Lovey Smith ends up failing in Houston. But the opportunity still presented itself here. And you knew it wasn't going to be perfect, and you were probably going to have to force their hand. Um, Joe Judge looks like he's going to um – Return to the Patriots. Mm. Uh, and now it's just been announced officially he is an offensive assistant, and it looks like with the loss of Josh uh, McDaniels that they might not go with an offensive coordinator, so Judge will be an offensive assistant for Bill Belichick. Mm. So he lands on his feet. I'm, I, you know what? I was worried. I'm glad he turned out okay. Were you a little worried? Yeah, when he had that big beer party, you know, he was crying into his – Bud Light and, and, and Papa John's. Michelob Ultra. Michelob Ultra and, and, and Papa John's. I was like, this poor guy's never going to work again, be in the street. But turns out he has another football job. And that, and that story was completely misrepresented as well. Totally. You no, know, it he was a, a cool party thing that for he his coaches to got let go. It was a nice thing to do. It was a nice thing to do. Well, you're making fun of it, though, because you're an animal. Well, I'm making fun of the idea. Whenever we worry too much about the the people in this field, they have families. I mean, ninety percent of the time, they end up on another team making a lot of money. Let's just be real. Giants hired uh, Wink Martindale after a long run as um, host of Card Sharks. He is now the new Wink. defensive coordinator uh, for Brian Dable. So Wink Martindale, who was with the Ravens as the defensive coordinator, fifty eight years old, fired this year, and. Um, 
He joins the Giants. A lot of people have been saying today, Giants might have made off better. He, they think that Martindale is more aggressive, more of a make things happen off defensive coordinator than than Patrick Graham was. So they might have won this trade. Who knows? Only time will tell. Yeah. So they get an experienced guy in Don Wink Martindale. I guess you got to accept the nickname, right? I don't know. It screams game show. It's oh, yeah. it's a wild name. I mean, it's let's just be honest. Being named Martindale is is a lot already. Well, you can't do anything with that. You were born into that. You were not born into Wink. Wink. I wonder how Wink Wink got uh, the name Wink. I think he was born with that. I'm going to look that up. I don't think uh, you're right. <laughs> game show host. Okay. Oh, he's actually related to the game show. Let me see this. Wait, well, then it makes even less sense. <laughs> it doesn't even make sense if you're related to have. No, it says, is he rela- Is Ravens coach. Okay. Uh, he is an alumnus of Defiance College where he played on the football team first and earned the nickname Wink, which he received due to sharing a last name with the famous game show host mm-hmm. of the air. So he's not related, no. And Wink Martindale's real name was Winston Conrad Martindale. But you know that works. Winston could be Wink. Yes. Don still, can't become Wink. But why did it become Wink? That's the question. Like, it's not what you would think of. Because of Wink Martindale, the game show host. No, no. But why did Winston Martindale? Because Winston, you could say W-I-N and just go, you know, Wink. It sounds like a game show host, Wink. But why? Why? Win, Winnie. Why? Winston, but someone going, you know what? Your wink is still wind horse at sea. Wind horse, sure. Well, Wink Martindale was a heck of a game show host. Well, he's Damn still right with us. Well, but I don't think he's working anymore. Well, no. just because there's ageism, I don't understand how at 88 he still couldn't like kill it on, uh, you know, one of these game shows right now. Best known for hosting Tick. Tac Doe from 78 to 85, Gambit from 72 to 76, High Rollers from 87 to 88, and Debt from 96 to 98. He went Giants by Wynn looking for, for a while. For the, uh, for the new, um, they're looking for another um, you know, quality control coach. They're calling Gene Rayburn. Is that true? Yeah, that's what I hear. Yeah, Gene's no longer with us. Mm-hmm. Well, you know what? When Don says someone's no longer with us, do we take it that as, well, as fact? Or dear God. Know? He buries people quicker than a grave digger. <laughs> we lost Gene Rayburn in '99, and you know what? We've not we've not been over it. No, he was great. <laughs> the long, thin microphone on Match Game, and the stuff that he would say, and he would put his arm around the women contestants. It was all very not PC. Not right now, huh? No, not right now. Um, hate to say it, everybody. Oh no. Once again, I am correct. Tom Brady. Kind of left the door open for coming back. You don't say, did he? Here he was on his uh, his podcast with his best buddy, Jim Gray. You know, I'm just going to take things as they come. You know, I think that's the best way to put it. And I, I don't think anything never, you know, you never say never. You know, at the same time, I know that I'm very, I feel very good about my decision. So I don't know how it feels six months from now. What? And it most likely won't. But, you know, I try to make the best possible decision I can in the moment, which I did this last week. And again, I think it's not looking to, you know, reverse course. I'm definitely not looking to do that. But in the same time, I think you have to be realistic that you never know what challenges there are going to be in life. Yeah, and I love playing. I'm looking forward to doing things other than playing. That's as honest as I can be with you there. That's, that's, come on, that's weak. Well, I mean, but why close the door? Because I'm sure he, he thinks there's a possibility, well, and that the, would check another thing off the list of I'm Superman. But, but Michael, if you're already contemplating returning, then why did you retire in the first place? <laughs> the whole idea is you retire, and then after a couple of years, you know what, I really miss it. I was lost at training camp. I, I felt like I was missing a limb. I had to go back. If, like, five minutes after you retire, you're already thinking about coming back, then you're wearing all in on retiring. You know what, though? I, in some ways, I respect it. Because what he does is he leaves the door open for, you know, the 49ers. uh, It doesn't work out with Lance, but they're a contender and they desperately would want Brady. And he then can say, hey, you know, I left the door open. If it's the perfect situation, why not? And I'm going to let you know a little secret. Having been around athletes for 40 years now, 40 years. um, So guys retire to spend more time with their family. Yeah, they want to kill themselves. 
the family wants to kill themselves. <laughs> the wife wants to kill herself. They, they, they don't know what they're in for. All of a sudden, they're home constantly. And that's why you see guys that retired to be with their family. They're constantly golfing. Sure. So who knows? Maybe Giselle will say, go out. Get a job. You just, you just don't you know, like, know. What do you mean? Like go down to like the Home Depot on weekends, cut some wood? Yeah. Something, something like, like that. that. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes start sense. a little project, you know, something, you know, get, build a shed. Like Carmela's spec house is what you're saying. That's, you know, something yeah. like that. Right. right. Now, we, we got to the bottom of it. Thanks to uh, Anthony Greek, uh, our producer on Yes. Wink Martindale, the game show host. Here's how he got his name, Wink. Okay. When I was a kid in Jackson, Tennessee, one of my playmates, Jimmy McCord, couldn't say Winston, which is my given name. And he had a speech impediment, and it came out sounding like Winky, Martindale told ABC News. So Winston turned into Winky, and then I got into the business, and Wink it was. It served me well, and I just kept Wink all these years. Nice. That must have been some speech impediment. Winston became Winky? Wink, horse at sea. Winston, after you know the cigarettes that everybody was smoking back then. Speaking of which, I I, I finally watched uh, Being the Ricardos. What'd you think? Tremendous. You liked it. Tremendous. Don, you watch yet? I haven't seen it, but uh, looking at the trailers, they got it right with the casting. Oh, how, like, how you wouldn't great think was so. The guy who played Fred. Oh, he just got nominated for an Oscar, and they, he's already won one. They were. That's the guy from the commercials. Yes, and he's from so many other things. Oz. Whiplash. He won the Oscar for Whiplash. Oh, he won the Oscar. And, and, yeah, he was in Oz. He was in so much stuff, that dude. But it was Rowling, awesome. I think his last name is. It was awesome. It was it, for Nicole Kidman's unbelievable. She truly is amazing. Well-deserved uh, Oscar nomination for her today, too. But, yeah, that, that movie was real. I didn't know basically anything. We I, mean, about- I, th- I think I had an idea that Desi wasn't the best husband, but I didn't really know anything about it. And, man, awesome movie. Were you talking about uh, J.K. Simmons? Yeah. yeah, sure he was, and he can confi- And he, I said he, Rowling. Yeah, he said <laughs> he confused. I completed it with the author of Harry Potter. Yeah, that's right. Maybe which, it's time way, for me to leave. Which, which it might be time way, for like, me to go. It's, this time <laughs> you might be right. The, yeah, because that was because like all of a sudden it just it's right in my wheelhouse, Peter. Because like three Reading like, in movies a yeah. week ago, uh, the people the the cast of the Harry Potter movies could walk ring my doorbell. I wouldn't know who they were. Right, and now I'm like three movies in already, and they're fantastic. The kids love them. They know the what kids, they're doing. The over kids there. already love them. Yeah. How do they understand a thing? About I don't think what's they going understand on? it, but it's got you know. But it's got it's got enough happening. It's that got it enough happen. going on. Right, right, got it. All right, so I spoke about this yesterday. I want to hold it up to the camera. So Ian O'Connor is going to be on with us next week. His book, uh, Coach K: The Rise and Reign of Mike Shashevsky. I spoke about the uh, the publicity photo on the inner jacket. I'm going to hold it up to the. Uh, to the camera, I mean, I've never seen a guy more unhappy. He, he's going to get a truckload of money for this book. It's going to be on the New York Times bestseller, and he, he, he looks like he's about to go in for a, a colonoscopy. I mean, you would agree, Don. Ian is a handsome man, but yeah, he's, the picture is, is just, he's, he's very right. upset, constipated I almost. I don't, like, I don't like you coming at my guy like this. Look at the picture. Well, it looks like a mugshot. Ian's a handsome guy. But why? What is the thing with not smiling in pictures? Some people don't like to smile. I think I look better when I don't smile. It looks all right, though. I mean, I, I it's not. I, it, I'm having trouble seeing it. I can kind of. I get the gist of it on TV. Have they sent you a book so you could read it? Don? On TV, I have not gotten it yet. No, unbelievable. I'm sure I'll get it within the next couple of days. Now, here but, it is. but you're not going to be able to finish it by the time he's on next week. I know. I'm hoping because I'm in the middle of a book. I'm going to need a book in about a few days. What book are you reading? Uh, the Frank Bellow autobiography. Who's that? The bass player from Anthrax. Oh, my God. I mean, what? listen. What, what how, many, like? how many books did that sell? If that sold more than Center Stage, oh I'll be really upset. So you got a lot of nerve. So you're not a fan of Anthrax. They played Madison, They played uh, Yankee Stadium, for God's sake. Well, I announced in Yankee Stadium. Ryan, you wrote a book. I'm you saying, who, who you think you're bigger book? than You think you're bigger than Anthrax? No, I'm not. Well, he wrote a nice book, and I'm reading it. Listen, that picture, uh, it's fine. I mean, it does, it's not that bad. He's not smiling, but he's not, like, mean-mugging either. Uh, he's closer to mean-mugging than smiling. He's, I mean, he's, he's a ravenously handsome guy. He should smile. Ravenously handsome. <laughs> that an ambulance coming for you, Peter? What? You, 
Do you hear an ambulance? Yeah, I hear an ambulance. I don't hear that. You may hear the wind whistling in my apartment. But oh, you, really? You must but be But if freezing. you hear that, that's incredible because it's very quiet with my headphone off. And this is a guy who doesn't hear very well. Wow, I'm very impressed by you, Michael. Thank you know, you. Every, every day, every day you show us something else. That, but that was – when you think about what Michael just said a minute ago. Go ahead. <laughs> like the, the – the, just the arrogance. How many books did that sell? As if, like, who would bother? Um, what a nice book. I'm enjoying it. Nick yeah. Casario, the Texans GM, said the lawsuit by Flores had no effect on the team's search – that ended with Smith's promotion from defensive coordinator. There were conversations with Brian after that. The lawsuit took place, so it really didn't affect our process at all. Yeah, I'm sure. What are you going to say? We were forced to do it? But just just look at it. Was he a candidate, Michael? No. He was there. He was the associate coach and, what, defensive coordinator. He was not on anybody's list. And then all of a sudden he got the job. But they can't say that. No, they can't. But but they also don't just blatantly lie. Well, I'd like to know how you're supposed to do that. Words are weapons. Figure it out. No. I would go. So could they have gotten away with, we did not have any intention of hiring Lovey Smith. We liked him, but we felt like Josh McCown was the better fit. But in lieu of the lawsuit, we reconsidered and our eyes opened to the possibility that maybe we're better off with Lovey. Listen, there are, Could people you get away with bright- that? Yeah, there are people brighter than both of us that can come up with something better than that. That was a little wordy. No, I think what they would come up with was lie, like they did. Mm-hmm. Uh, That's let's right. Take a, let's it's, take got, a, uh, it's got four and a half stars. What? On Amazon. That's not bad. What? The the, the Frank Bellow book. Uh, is it good? I'm enjoying it. Okay. I, I mean, I you, you just have so much time in life, and you're wasting I, I just, it on a Frank I, Bellow book. I'm just know, shocked. I can't. You're, you're not. You're one to talk. You waste a lot of time on things. You both. I cannot. I see, I'm serious. I, I'm embarrassed about this. I wish I could read in, in a better way. I don't know how. I've been reading last week's New Yorker for a week straight, I, I, and I've made it through two articles. I don't know how you guys do it. You finish a book. A, Don finishes books every week. I'm working on two books, Don, by the way. So I'm, I'm, I'm working on the Coach K book to prepare myself for the interview, which Peter will you know, sit out. Right. Uh, and then I'm in the middle of an 800-page book by Joe Posnanski, The Baseball 100. Unbelievable how good it is. Hmm. He rates the 100 best players in baseball, but each one of them, it's like a huge chapter on each player. Inside stuff. I, it's, it's unbelievable how good it is. 800 pages. That's a lot. That's at least three bathroom trips for you. And then b- before this book, I-, I finished the Chris Herring book, Blood in-, in the Garden. That was fabulous. Very good. I liked it, too. And before that, I, I was I really enjoyed the uh, Mel Brooks book. You didn't enjoy it that much. Now you're lying. No, I did. You thought it was a little bit too intense. No, I thought in the, the beginning time. he gave a lot of detail about being in the Army and living in Brooklyn. But then once he started getting to the movies and everything, fascinating stuff. Do you ever reread books, like the um, Booger book or something like that? The only thing that I ever reread, because I, I, I've read it when I was a kid, and then I read it when I was like a teenager, I want to read it again, is They Call Me Assassin. <laughs> He's so dark. He really is. He's dark. He's reading the biography of the drummer from Anthrax. He, he read They Call Me Assassin twice. There's just, so much stuff I'm going on. I'm just impressed by the amount of reading. It's To me, it's, it's remarkable. It's, well, it's well, a Peter, book about Jack Tatum. It's a football book. But, Still. But Donnie. But, but, Peter, Don and I, although we have children, we do have some free time. Every time you have free time, you start another podcast, so you don't have time to read. That's First of all, that's not true. Second of all, I just uh, – listen, I'm giving you guys credit. I wish I could. I If I sit down at night, I, I just am not good at spending my night reading. And for me to make a dent on a book, I'd have to literally get off the air and spend three hours reading to make a nice solid dent on a book. Oh, you're not a good reader? I've never thought of myself as being a bad reader. I don't struggle with words, but it just doesn't go quickly. <laughs> I'm, I'm like, maybe she's taking an Evelyn Wood course. It was the best of times. times. I can't read. It was the worst of wor- times. Wor- right, right. That, that's that's about worse. my pace per sentence. <laughs> uh, you know what? It's nothing to be proud of, Sal. <laughs> so I just don't know how you guys keep knocking them out. And, and then if I read too late at night, I fall asleep. Well, well, that's all purpose. The, that's one of the things. But then, how do you do. ever finish the? But you finished the book in three days. 
That's the thing I don't get. Because it's called commitment. I, I Listen, I guess I'm just dumb. <laughs> Maybe that's it. We'll be back in just a moment right here on Yes at 98.7 ESPN. Thanks for listening to the Michael K. Show podcast. Hey, buddy. Hey. Catch the show on demand wherever you want. Just subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts. Hey, everybody. It's me. I'm back. And guess what? It's another Don segment. We're doing the list, Michael. I don't care if you don't like it. The Daily Don. I'll fight to the death for this list. It's the Daily Don Show. He makes lists. Take it away, Donnie. All right, continuing with the Super Bowl theme, guys. How about top five unlikely Super Bowl MVPs? Wow. Top five unlikely Super Bowl MVPs. That's right. Now, when you say unlikely, Don, do you mean unlikely like when you look at them in their entire career or just in that game specifically, it's not the name you would have thought of? Right, going into the game, you would not think this guy is going to be the MVP. I'll try one. Ready? Go Go ahead. Otis Anderson. Mm, I thought about it just because it wasn't a quarterback, but it was a pretty big name. I'm sure he was on the list of possibilities, especially for the Giants who predominantly ran the ball, so do not have him in the top five. Unbelievable. Who are you taking out? Don't know yet. Um, Would you like me to go again, Peter? I'm just, I know who I want to remember. Hmm. Did Vaughn? No, no, that wouldn't be it. Go ahead, I, Michael. How about Jake Scott of Miami? Thought about Jake Scott. Go back to Super Bowl Seven with the Miami Dolphins, but I did not include oh. him. But I did think about it. It was. Uh, you can ask Andrew. It was on my short list. But you thought about it. I did. Safety. Good player. So I almost said it. Uh, no, so I, Von Miller would be too good a player. Too good a player. Um, how about Malcolm Smith, though? You know, Malcolm Smith, great pull. I have him at number four, linebacker for the Seahawks back in Super Bowl 48. The only player on the list that's still in the league. How great about, pull, Peter. How about, uh, let's go to Super Bowl five. Chuck Howley of the Cowboys. You know, I thought about Chuck Howley. Of course you did. He, didn't, he thought about all of mine, but they're not on the list. Well, it was, it was on the short list. He was a six-time Pro Bowl. He was a really, really good player. Um, so I thought about him. I'm like, yeah, you know what? He he was a really good player. It was probably a shock. He was the first defensive player ever to win the MVP. But I did not have him in the top five. But a great poll, Michael. Great poll. What about Dexter Jackson? Oh, Dexter Jackson, Peter. Another great poll. I have him at number one. Oh, yeah. Cornerback, Buccaneers, Super Bowl 37. Both of his picks came in the first half. Only his fourth or fifth year in the league. I think he was 25 years old at the time he won it. Dexter Jackson is number one. How about Larry Brown? Oh, Larry Brown. That's a great one, Michael. I have him at five because he was a three-time Super Bowl champion, but I don't think anybody expected him to inter- intercept Neil O'Donnell as many times as he did in Super Bowl 30 to win the MVP. I have the former cornerback at number five. So Larry Brown, number five. Malcolm Smith of the Seahawks is number four. And I've got Dexter Jackson, number one. So we're looking for three and two. How about Desmond Howard? Oh, that is a great pull. You're doing a fantastic job, Peter. I'm going to go with Desmond Howard. Now, was he a good player? He sure won the Heisman Trophy. But he's a kick returner that wins the MVP. I have him at number two for the Packers in Super Bowl 31. Had like 220 all-purpose yards in that game, including a 99-yard kick return for a touchdown. I've got Desmond Howard at two. Uh, I mean, a quarterback should not be an upset, but you look at his career, how about Mark Rippon? Yeah, I mean, they, they I, I, Peter can correct me if I'm wrong, I think they led the league in offense that year. And, sure, and they I, did. Again, I, I didn't include any quarterbacks. I probably would have went with Doug Williams over Mark Rippon, but it's, is it really that much of a shock when a quarterback wins the MVP? I'm sure when you got the odds, even though they were underdogs in the game, they were still – that favorite. you're still going to get pretty decent, you know, a chance to, to be an MVP. So I didn't include any quarterbacks. So no Nick Foles, no Doug Williams, Mark Rippon, or, or how, that ilk. How about uh, Richard Dent for oh, the Bears? Richard Dent, that's a, that's a nice poll. Super Bowl twenty, but no. Okay. How about the duo of Harvey Martin and Randy White? 
Again, very good. Thought about it, but they were both really great players. So what I about uh, have, I do not have the duo. What about I mean, he was a nice player and he's nice an offense. player. And no, no, I'm not talking about him, but I'm talking about th- this guy's an <laughs> offensive player and a nice <laughs> player, but still not a name you think about as a Super Bowl MVP. Dion Branch. You know what? This is Peter's the MVP of this segment. Dion Branch. You know what? Also unlikely. Of number three, <laughs> wide receiver with the Patriots wins it in Super Bowl 39. You're right. No Tom Brady, and, and again, no Pro Bowls during the course of his career. Nice player, but not somebody you would think that would take home MVP honors. So Larry Brown of the Cowboys, number five. Malcolm Smith of the Seahawks, four. Dion Branch of the Patriots, three. Desmond Howard of the Packers, two. Dexter Jackson, number one from the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And I did have written down uh, Chuck Howley, uh, Jake Scott. I did have written down as How well. How is Jake so. Scott not there? It's a disgrace. Well, you know what? Who are you taking out? Yeah, who are you taking well, out? I'm several asking. people could take out. Well, Jake Scott. Who are you taking out? Well, like, well I, I didn't really ask, we didn't ask you how many, Michael. We all asked right, get, you who. All right, give me the list again. All right, well, thank you for paying attention. Larry Brown. You could take him out for Jake Scott. Okay. Malcolm Smith. Also for Jake Scott. Dion Branch. I'll keep Dion Branch in. Desmond Howard. Keep him in. And Dexter Jackson. Yeah, could take him out for Jake Scott. For Awful number one? List. No. Yeah. Oh, that's a great list, though. Thank you, Peter. That's enough for me. That's all you need. But Peter, I, I, Peter but did it, a it, terrific it, job today. Yeah, but you know what? And it's perfect. The most unlikely guy to do a terrific job picks the most unlikely MVPs. I think it's beautiful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Really is great. Uh... All right, let's take a brief time out. Yeah, we should. We should going to revisit off. the big trade. And, you know, um, Alan Hahn heard uh, us talking about him, and he's going to join us sometime in the next segment. Really? To defend his indefensible position. Yeah, because you kind of called him out, Michael. Oh, really? Is that what you're trying to start now? Well, no, you said you disagreed. You said, no, actually, to quote you, said he's wrong. All right. All right, I'm, I'm not saying it's out. a bad thing. Well, that's calling somebody out. I think you're wrong. I think he's wrong. I don't think he's given Sabonis enough love. All right. Well, and that's and it's a good thing because I want him. To, I want him to defend himself. Don't feel bad about it. I think it's terrific. <laughs> okay. Don't beat yourself up. <laughs> I won't. Coming up, Halliburton Sabonis could he have gotten to the Knicks? I'd like to know how. Maybe Alan could tell us right here on Yes and ninety-eight-seven ESPN. Thanks for listening to the Michael K. Show podcast. Well, that's awesome. Looking for more access to the show? That's right, man. Check us out on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at TMKS ESPN. I want to thank the Carmi. Um, they they came out in droves, and I ended up beating uh, Gary Thorne's um, Don Mattingly, you could hold on to the roof call, mm-hmm. with my Jeter Mr. November call. Wow, you cheated. And this now, is- you know why I feel good about this? Because the three hosts on MLB Network Radio and Sirius, they all voted against me. The only reason I won is because the Carmi. The Carmi and the callers on the show. So Jenny Kavnar voted for Gary Thorne. Um, Ryan Spielborgs voted for Gary Thorne. CJ Nikowski voted for Gary Thorne. All wow. dead to me right now. But um, the Twitter people and the callers, uh, they're worth five points apiece. The host worth just two points. I won ten to six. Now I'm ticked off. Now, now we'll go all the way, Carmi. Well, now, uh, I, I you said, don't feel bad at all that you just like no. You bullied the system. No, I didn't bully it. I gamed it. But here's the thing: I had said that I'd give a thousand dollars to Michael's charity if we got him a win. But that was before I found out that they also vote. So it's not just about the the the, the Twitter votes. Oh, you're going to back out of the thousands? Well, I, think I have to because it's not the same. Because obviously they got something against you. CJ really surprises me. I consider him a friend. I, that's a slap in the face. Why don't you get a hold of him? I mean, it really is what an insult. But, you know, we won. We move on. I'll tell the Carmi the next uh, next matchup we have. I think it's against Vince Scully, which will make me feel guilty, but I'll oh, still do it. You're gonna, and you're going to do that anyway. Um, Let me think. Yeah. Let's yeah, go to Sam do. in the Hudson Valley. Sammy. Hey, Michael, what's going on, buddy? All good, hey, you? I just want to say, I'm pretty good, I'm pretty good, thank you. But I want to say, Michael, listen, uh, I got to give up my man Peter a lot of, a lot of, you know, thumbs up, big ups, great guy, morning show, your show. And you know what? I give him big ups because if he had said that story that you just said about waking up in the morning and how busy you are throughout the day, he never asked you what you would have asked him. You would have asked him, hey, when do you get time with Miss Hatton? 
When are you That's a great doing a little, you know, play with Miss Hatton? And you know what? Peter is so respectable. He didn't go there. No. no. Yeah, and and by the way, fine. it's a great point by you. Thank you. And also, uh, someone pointed this out on Twitter, Don. I thought it was a great point. They said, imagine if Peter's response to Michael about uh, his other job was, well, I'm not really a Yankee fan. We don't watch baseball in the house, so I've never seen you call a game. Mm. Listen, unbelievable. I, I, I love you. You know that. Like, like you know, a brother that you know went went with the other parent and you're like you know you're like Phil Leotardo talking about Vito. No, I no. loved him. I loved him like a brother-in-law. Love you, love you, but my allegiance on this. I'm listening to DPH and Rothenberg. I want this station to do well. You're doing fine at Hot 97. Perfect. Sure. You could you could flip over after you listen to DPH and Rothenberg. No, but I, I also have to listen to Keyshawn J. Will and Max. Yeah, I have okay, to listen you know. to everything here. Okay. I'm sure the commercials don't jive all the time. Thank well, you, but, but the commercials are important. They pay the salaries. Okay? So, so you feel like you have to listen to the commercials. Yes, I feel uh, like you're so that's, that's officially that's... out of your mind. Come get some. Yeah. Can't wait. Let's go to James <laughs> in Washington Township. James. Hey, hey fellas. Uh, I just want to say I have a listener since 47. Love you guys. Thanks, Thanks man. So I just want to say you kind of belittled. Gambling addiction, saying it's not as bad as alcohol addiction and all the other addictions, when in my opinion... No, no, I, I meant numbers, by work. the way. I meant numbers, numbers, not 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 the oh. actual addiction, sorry. I meant it's dwarfed in numbers, oh. and it's funny that people don't give alcohol sort of the same hard time that they give gambling addiction, because I, I, that's not what I meant oh, to say. Uh, alcohol addiction, yeah, you're right, alcohol addiction by numbers, uh, it, it's, yeah, by far, it's, it's exceedingly numerous. But the gambling addiction, in my opinion, as far as damage it does, mm. I've literally known people to lose houses. And it's. Oh, yeah. yeah. You can only drink so much. You can only do so many drugs. When it comes to gambling, you could lose everything you have right. and other people have. It's, it's my, that's just my opinion, but yep. I think it does the most damage. No, I, I don't think I have to speak Can for I? Peter, but I don't think he was diminishing. Yeah, no, yeah. all know, addictions the, are, are, are addictions awful. are awful, and they're awful for families. But, but he's just know. saying in terms of the numbers. But the only yeah, no, the, can... the fact that the state had to spend so long deciding whether or not they could stand behind gambling, but they stand behind alcohol and tobacco, et cetera. No, that but was the, the, but all all addictions ruin the lives of of you and your family. And also, you can't say, well, there's only so much drugs and alcohol you can do. Yeah, because you could die, too. Right, 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 right. So let's not sit there and measure addiction. All the addictions can do a lot of damage, but it's just interesting that outside of prohibition, it's never really even been thought about banning alcohol. And that really didn't work either. Listen, no. I, I hear people drink. Let's go to Scott in Manhattan. Scott. Hey, Don, Michael, Pete, you know, big fan, uh, first-time caller, long-time listener. But, Don, quick question for you. Um, you know, as a big Rangers fan in New York, I would, uh, you know, we're all pretty excited and getting excited for, for the whole team. But, honest opinion, how far do you think this team can go in the postseason? I mean, I, I think they can make it to the second round. Now, obviously, if, if, if Shesterkin stands on his head, we've seen it before, that he could steal a series and maybe go farther. But, Remember, they haven't played Pittsburgh yet. They've only played one game against Carolina and lost. I mean, these are the teams they're going to have to get through. And they've got a very yep. difficult schedule in these last 35 games. They haven't played St. Louis. They've got two games with them uh, coming up. They've got a couple of games left with Boston. So uh, I, I, I think they're a playoff team. There's no question. I think the eight teams are already in now. But you want to finish yep. in that top three and get yourself a, a, an easier opponent in the first round. But – if they drop to the wild card, you know, it's gonna be it's gonna be tough. I, I think you want to make it to the second round, but let's not forget this team has not gone to the playoffs since 2017, and there's a lot of guys on that team that have never, outside of going to the bubble a couple of years ago, which really doesn't count. They don't know what it's like to play in a best of seven series yet. So get to the playoffs and see what happens. But I think you could be very satisfied if this team went one around. But hey, they continue winning guys over the next 35 with the schedule they have. Maybe maybe you. Uh, you tweak your expectations a little bit once you get to the playoffs. We got a long way to go before we get to May. We don't have a long way to go to ENN. That's coming up in just a moment. It's going to be special. It's oh, going to sure. be lit. Oh, Everybody's yeah. talking about it. Right. Peter is really, really going to do an unbelievable mm. job. That's coming up right here on Yes and 98.7 ESPN. Thanks for listening to the Michael K Show podcast. Hear more of Michael, Don, and Peter live weekday afternoons starting at 3 on 98.7 ESPN in New York. The ESPN app, the TuneIn app, or on your smart speaker. Hey Alexa, play 98.7 ESPN.